which then is named Trolltech. And in 1995, they released the first version of Qt, Qt 0.9. And it looks like this beautiful thing. You know this example from the documentation. I think it probably is still there somewhere. So this is 1995, and that's the story of Qt. And one, one of the really innovative things um, um, Eric and Howard did is decided on a dual licensing business model. So they had the Qt profession, which was their commercial offering for all platforms and all projects, uh, including proprietary. So that's where they made money from. And innovative thing they did is they decided on releasing a Qt free edition as well under a free edition license for software projects which were free software. So free projects using free software on X11 um, got this edition for free. The other part of the story we have to tell is the story of KDE. So one year later in 1996, PCs are still a thing. Windows has actually grown, is there. Um, Unix has something called the Common Desktop Environment, CDE, quite an enterprisey thing. And Linux is also coming along. Kernel 2.0 is just released, and there are a number of Linux distributions. So the big ones, Debian, Red Hat, SUSE, they are already around at the time, and um, they are starting to becoming more and more successful. But if you look at the state of the graphical use on Linux, it's still quite sad. This is how a Linux looked like. Um, not very convenient, not very consistent, uh, quite difficult to control, and certainly not made for ordinary people, but for us who were using their command line tools in this uh, uh, window manager. So this situation obviously was something which changed. And in 1996, in October, Matthias Ettrich, a German student, Usenet post. And he asked for programmers who wanted to join a project to create an actual user interface, a graphical user interface for users, which was for normal people, not only the, the developers. And in his first email, he had actually two firm decisions. One was the stuff will be distributed under the terms of the GPL. So this was the start of a free software project. This was meant to be a to use the power of the many people who are around. And the other decision he made is that this should be based on Qt, because he saw Qt as a very strong technical foundation to actually implement this somewhat cleaner desktop, how he calls it. And he also recognized Trolltech's business model and said, yeah, this kind of marketing, free source code for free software, that's something what I like. And um, this was actually the base which actually made it possible to develop KDE on Qt. So he asked for 20, 30 programmers to join, um, and that happened. And in 1997, there was the first KDE presentation at the Linux Congress in Würzburg. That was an actually quite high profile event back then. So quite a number of prominent people joined there. Ted So was there, Eric Raymond was there, Dirk Honel was there, John Maddock Hall. They all talked about Linux, all kind of things, all kind of things, uh, free software. And also Qt had a strong present. So Howard was there talking about Qt. Um, Kalle Dahlheimer, who was one of the first people joining Matthias Call and one of the core developers um, back then, he had to talk about programming on Linux. And Matthias himself, he talked about KDE and showed the first screenshot of KDE um, at the stage. So this is a screenshot on, of the original proceedings of the Congress showing KDE uh, pre-release, um, uh, the current state back then. And this also already looks quite promising. That was a huge success. So the story goes that there, is another, there was another project, um, desktop project, which had a, a, a talk a planned for after the KDE presentation. And after they had seen what KDE presented there, they canceled the talk and left the conference. So KDE had quite an impact there. Proceedings, what Matthias wrote there. So, sorry, this is in German, but that's the original. And he basically said three things there in this, this section. So, the first one is Qt is the only possible solution from a technical point of view to actually be able to implement that. 
So they check different things and um, all these different widgets around, there are lots of different things, but not very uh, well developed and quite different. And not really. So he saw the chance to some unification there and using Qt as the technique. And he also hinted at a problem KDE had, and that was Qt's license. So critics said Qt is not free. And what's interesting is to see how Matthias framed it. So he put a sentence there, tongue in cheek. Um, yeah, we created a mailing list for discussing Qt license. So the people who are doing the actual work are not disturbed by these discussions. But it was a big discussion and, and it uh, followed for a couple of time after that. And the big question there was, how free is free? So is, K, is Qt actually free software or not? And a lot of quite influential people from the FSF, from Red Hat, from the GIMP team, they argued that the Qt free edition license uh, doesn't fulfill the requirements of free software. So it wasn't the GPL, but it was a homegrown license. Um, and it had some conditions in there which uh, were not compatible with what the GPL was doing. So people argued Qt is not free enough. The intention, of course, was to make it as free as, as it's needed for free software, um, but this was not accepted by everybody. And the other big question was, how, what, what happens if Trolltech stops developing Qt? What happens if um, the, the toolkit is discontinued, if the company goes away? What happens with that? And um, the license didn't really allow changing it and uh, further developing it. So this was one of the open questions the community had to answer and which led to quite a debate. And there was another threat. Um, Kalle Dahlheimer said that um, you have to understand that in, in, the, the, in this time, it was actually common that companies would buy other companies just to shut down projects. And one of the fears there was that Microsoft would uh, come and actually shut down Qt in some way. So Microsoft was in a situation back then when it was really actively fighting Linux. Um, so this was uh, quite real. And you can see it, um, th this is a famous advertisement from a German computer magazine where Microsoft actually said, yeah, if you use Linux, you, you will get mutations. You don't have it under control. Then later in 1997, um, there was a pivotal meeting in the history of KDE. KDE won the developer meeting in Ansberg. This was the first time all the KDE developers got together. Um, Arnsberg is a small German town. Um, there is a manufacturer of wafer makers actually who was uh, using Linux. They had some Linux fans and they set up some X terminals for the KDE developers to work on. They invited them to Arnsberg. So they had the meeting there. And it came at a pretty delicate time because two weeks before this meeting, GNOME was founded as um, an answer or a reaction to the license question. And um, so there was competition out there. And uh, Trolltech sent um, Eric and Arndt uh, to Germany to join the meeting and um, to work together with the KDE people and obviously also to, to discuss the, the question of the license. And you have to realize that at that time, Trolltech was just six employees and KDE had something like 200 developers working in KDE. So the strategy of Qt worked. So they, they got this huge community adoption. They got this many people who actually use Qt. And on the other hand, it also worked for KDE, strong uh, toolkit in Qt. So they had the discussions about how, how do they deal with the license question. And uh, Trolltech made, made a pretty bold offer there. So they said, okay, we, we want to have a contract between the community and the company, which makes sure that Qt stays free forever. So the KD people were a bit shocked by that. Um, they didn't expect that much uh, from, from that. But um, in, in the end, of course, that, that was a pretty good solution. And they went ahead with that. And then later um, in 1998, beginning of 1998, the statement of intent was signed uh, by the KDE side, um, Kalle and Matthias, and the Qt side with um, Eric and Tobi. And they, they laid down the two uh, main things there which the agreement should um, uh, have. And the one was to have this foundation which makes sure that the Qt free edition is available and updated um, for free software development. And the second part that if this is not happening, if the company is stopping the Qt free edition, that it shall be released under the BSD license, which would allow um, a lot more liberal things to do with the toolkit to actually keep up things. And we'll talk about that later. So this was the agreement they had. And then um, Trolltech 
hired um, a prestigious Norwegian lawyer and had to explain to them that uh, they actually wanted to give away something for free and want to make sure that the company doesn't have a chance to change that. It was an interesting challenge. But uh, once the lawyer understood that, they were ready to go and they wrote the actual agreement. So how does it work? Um, the thing is that um, at this time, there wasn't a legal entity on behalf of KDE. So the first thing which was happening was that KDE EV was founded. This happened at the end of 1997. And uh, Trotec EV created together this uh, foundation, which is called the KDE Free Cube Foundation. The reason to do that in a separate foundation was that um, in the case Trotec would go bankrupt, um, then it would get hard to get access to the assets of uh, Troltech. And of course, the, the software queue, the licenses would be an asset. So they said, okay, we, we put that into an independent foundation. So that is something which can't be taken away. Um, and the license agreement, which Troltech gives to the Q KDE Free Cute Foundation, gives the guarantee that the Q KDE Free Cute Foundation can then actually do what is necessary to keep Cute free. And the foundation is actually a very small thing. It only consists of two representatives of uh, both sides. And they build the board of the foundation, which take to, takes the decision. And um, there's a twist there, because KDE has a majority in case of ties. So if uh, there is a two to two voting, then KDE decides about the result, which gives KDE the leverage to actually keep uh, the, uh, yeah, the license free of Qt um, in case something happens. And the primary uh, tool to do that is that um, the license agreement says if no major updates of Qt, of the Qt Free Edition happen, in five months, then the foundation can release the Qt Free Edition under the BSD license. And the consequences of that are it protects Qt against bankruptcy, takeover, and change of plans, because under the BSD license, you actually have um, the permission to use it for all kinds of projects, open source as well as proprietary. So that's a li very liberal license. And it also allows to build, again, a new company with a similar dual licensing business model. That's something which you can do with the BSD license. You inc can incorporate into proprietary offerings. Uh, but th this wouldn't be possible with the GPA. So then in 1998, the agreement finally is signed in June. Um, there's an announcement, and this has a nice statement in it. It says, we believe the founding of the KDE Free Cute Foundation to be an unprecedented groundbreaking step, ushering in a new era of software development, allowing the KDE project, the free software community, all free software developers, as well as commercial software developers, to prosper in a mutually supportive fashion. Quite a bold statement. I think it ref reflects the mindset of KDE and Qt at that time. Uh, but it's actually quite powerful and has carried on uh, the project and the foundation over the years. This is the actual agreement, which was signed three pages. And then a few weeks later, KDE 1.0 was released based on Qt 1.2. And it looked like this. This is still not a beautiful desktop. It's a great start, and the project has a lot of momentum. And it evolved. And over the time, also, the license of Qt evolved. Um, Trotec added the QPL after some time, which then was actually accepted as an open source license. Um, later, they changed it to the GPL. And this was the point in time which actually ended all the discussions about if Qt is free software or not. KDE also evolved, had major updates. And the agreement in 2004 was updated as well to reflect the change in licensing also in the, in the uh, releases of Qt and how K KDE used it. In 2005 also added um, under the GPL in Qt 4, um, but at that time it wasn't covered by the agreement yet. One of the challenges there with the K with the agreement is that the question, what is the Qt free edition, actually is the crucial question of, of the whole agreement. So what actually means discontinued? What means major update? What is part of Qt? What do you do with deprecated modules and stuff like that? 
uh, also what platforms are covered by the agreement. Um, at the writing of the agreement, for example, embedded platforms uh, weren't around, so nobody thought about that. What about Windows? What about mobile phones and stuff like that? Also, what licenses are acceptable? What, what happens with, with the GPL version 3, which um, was relevant at some point? So this is the crucial thing, which um, always needed some discussion and debate and continuous working on the agreement to adapt it to the current um, state. And then uh, with, with the discussions which were, were happening in the KD Free Food Foundation, this actually was quite helpful to, uh, to yeah, create this balance, to balance the interests between the community and the company. And the foundation gave this platform to actually have these discussions. Then in 2008, there was an email to KDEV by the Trotec management. And it said, yeah, Trolltech is acquired by Nokia. So this was the moment where the agreement was put to test. This was where, what the agreement was designed for. And people were actually interested in what was happening there. Um, we were quite aware that um, this would be an interesting situation. But in this case, Nokia actually went with that in a very responsible way. So they contacted us very early um, KDE was at the table. Um, we had meetings with the Nokia management in Frankfurt. Um, that was a fun uh, with where, where the Nokia managers uh, visited us in our then very small office with half an employee shared with the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and uh, we had uh, about Qt and uh, KDE there. And then we had the uh, invitation back to the Nokia headquarters in Helsinki, uh, which was, of course, quite a contrast. But the great thing was we, we discussed these things on eye level because it was clear that uh, the agreement was in place um, and it would uh, stay in place and that we would have to talk about how we do the best uh, with that for the communities. Uh, Nokia also added the LGPL. Um, there was a third agreement to reflect the changes, and Qt 5 then um, was developed under open governance when Nokia opened Qt to actually contributions of more people. They were quite ambitious. Um, uh, Sebastian Nyström, who was running uh, the Qt uh, part of Nokia at that time, he said in the keynote on the Qt Dev Days in 2009 that uh, they wanted to increase the reach of Qt tenfold. And that's something clearly you can't do without the community outreach. So over the years, more evolution. Um, Nokia, of course, changed plans. Um, that's a different story. Digia acquired Qt. Um, Qt 5 was released. Uh, there was the fourth agreement reflecting the changes. Then the Qt company was uh, uh, formed and eventually uh, went public. Another agreement reflected the changes there. And that's basically the state where we are today. Um, uh, we have this agreement in place. We are in constructive discussions with the cute company, and uh, it still is valid. There's one twist in the story which is interesting. Um, the agreement also was built to prevent selling Qt to Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft actually acquired most part of Nokia in uh, uh, in, in 2013, and uh, this this is uh, where Qt already was in the hands of of Digia. So also there, the agreement worked. What's the end of the story? Well, uh, we can say mission accomplished, Qt stayed free, Qt stayed free um, across multiple acquisitions, um, and that's what the agreement was, was meant to do, so this worked. But of course, this is not the end of the story because Qt is still there and KDE is still there, and they have a, a, a hopeful, gloryful future, um, so the agreement will still uh, be there and uh, serve this purpose. But there, there are a couple of things uh, which can be learned from it. And <clears throat> one is that this was really a solid thing. Um, it served for more than 20 years. Qt stayed free. And uh, KDE and Qt both had quite, quite um, good success and impact. So this certainly was a good foundation. And it worked in two ways. One was that the license guaranteed the present freedom, so once you had the code under the, the GPL of Qt and KDE, of course, you could do whatever you want with that under the conditions of the license, um, but only with the, Q, the code you already had. And the foundation guaranteed also something about the future freedom, so that the code would be developed in an open and free way in the future as well. 
And through the foundation, you had this mechanism to foster a dialogue and this balancing between community and commercial interests. So quite, quite a strong setup, which actually keeps things free. One question is sometimes asked, what about a fork? Um, if I have the code under the GPL, I can just, just fork it. Why do I need the agreement? That's true, but it would split the community. Um, and it also wouldn't allow the dual license business model on the fork. So the more sustainable version is to not fork, but work under the agreement, uh, work under the current situation. The other question which is asked sometimes is, is this a model for other projects as well? So could you use that in other projects? And the answer is, there is a certain type of projects where this might actually be a good fit. So the typical use case would be something like a single vendor project where you have one company controlling an open source project and they are following some dual license model. And uh, for that to work, they need a CLA, which gives them the rights to also release a proprietary version. And the problem there is that this is an asymmetric setup. So the company has more rights than the community has. And that, of course, can be a demotivation for people to actually participate in this project. The KD FreeCut Foundation style setup is a way to balance this. So that there you add something on the other side where the community gets a say in the future of the project and gives some security about the freedom of the project for the future. And this is a way to motivate actually people to contribute because they know it's not only the company profiting from, from that, but they also give something back and they are obliged to actually do that. That's what the KD Free Good Foundation does. One thing to be aware of is that this is a complex thing. Um, the agreement is now 14 pages, not three pages anymore. Most of that is about the question, what actually forms Qt? How, is, how has this developed? What, what do we have to take into account for that? But that's actually the thing you need to do. And that's a result of these fruitful discussions about um, how free do we do it? Uh, how is the balance between that? And how can we balance the interests in a mutually beneficial way? And the other thing, which also is, I think, quite important, um, it takes courage to do that. So it takes this courage of the original founders of, of Trolltech, uh, which said we give it away for free. And this is an important thing because we didn't know if it would work, but it actually did. So the KDE Free Cute Foundation, what's the heart of it? It's the freedom. It's the freedom, which is also a strong value we have in KDE, which is driving our work. And we do that because freedom is good for business, freedom is good for community, and freedom is good for the world. And I want to close with a quote from the original announcement. So to prosper in a mutually fashion. This is what the KDE Free Cute Foundation set out to do, and this is what it did and what it still does. So that's what I wanted to tell you about the KDE Free Cute Foundation. Thank you.